Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this short video presentation about instance angle for wind turbines. A few folk have asked a few questions about this during uh, problem classes and uh, office hours and things like that, and it seemed a good topic for our first short video presentation, trying to clarify some of the peripheral issues around the course. So, let's just recap how to draw a velocity triangle for a wind turbine. If we looked up at that wind turbine we saw in the picture a moment ago, we might see a aerofoil shape whizzing over from the right to the left here. And this is the frame velocity, made up obviously of the rotational speed omega multiplied by the radius r. If we arranged ourselves underneath the, uh, underneath the wind turbine tower, uh, and we would see a velocity v coming directly down towards us, uh, and we would, uh, we would have to draw our velocity triangle based on those two bits of information. And just in the coordinate frame of reference we're using here, we have a tangential direction theta uh, moving from uh, right to left, so that's positive in the direction of rotation. And similarly we have an axial direction and it's positive down the page, uh, which is parallel to the axis of rotation of the machine, hence the name. Now just to recap about how to draw the velocity triangle, the first thing we would do is draw the flow that we know, which in this case is the absolute velocity v. We would then connect that up with the relative velocity u, uh, and then we would close the triangle uh, to give us the uh, relative velocity w. And we can of course check that we've got the right velocity triangle by following the relative velocity, then the frame velocity, and checking to see if we ended up at the same place as we would if we'd simply followed the velocity v in the first place. And we do, so that looks like that velocity triangle is correct. And you can see how this relative velocity, which is the velocity experienced if we were sitting on the wind turbine, if we were in the frame of reference of this particular bit of metal spinning around, experiences a flow w uh, that's quite different from the absolute flow v. So, if we just look at how wind tunnel data is uh, obtained, uh, this gives a bit of insight into maybe why people are having a little bit of difficulty uh, understanding the sign convention here. So if you have a velocity w coming along from the left to the right uh, onto an aerofoil shape, uh, you would expect a bit of lift to be produced and a bit of drag to be produced as well. Just to say something about the geometric definition of an aerofoil, uh, you normally have a leading edge and a trailing edge, and the distance between those is known as the chord. That's all straightforward when everything's uh, lined up with the incoming flow, but if you tilt the aerofoil a little bit uh, from the incoming flow, you end up with an instance angle. And you normally define that instance angle as the angle between the incoming flow and a line between the trailing edge, uh, sorry, the leading edge and the trailing edge of the aerofoil. So you draw a straight line between those two, extend that out there, and the angle that makes with the incoming flow is known as the instance. Now, since this diagram here is of a symmetrical aerofoil, you don't get much lift when you, uh, when you have uh, flow coming straight on, but uh, when you tilt the aerofoil, you get quite a lot of streamlined curvature over the top, you generate quite a lot of lift at the top here, uh, and perhaps a little bit of drag. And uh, to collect a bunch of data, what you would do uh, to, to, to characterize the flow around this aerofoil, you would take a bunch of readings at different incidences, and then you would normalize the lift and drag. And this is what has been done on this next slide here. What we've done here is we've taken a whole load of instance measurements at about uh, a five degree spacing, uh, though we seem to have taken a couple quite close together around about the stall point, uh, and we've measured the lift. And then we've normalized that lift uh, by a half rho times w squared uh, times c, so that we can scale this data up for different sized aerofoils and different wind conditions as well. So, uh, what you can see here is since it's a symmetrical aerofoil, there's very little lift uh, at zero incidence uh, that increases to a maximum about 1.3, and then there's a stall. Uh, and stall is quite a complex aerodynamic phenomenon, and it's not really the subject of today's video, but you basically get a reduction in lift and a big increase in drag when that happens. So, that's how you collect aerofoil data in the wind tunnel. So, just to emphasize that incidence is the angle between the cord line and the incoming flow. And the other thing to make clear is that this lift force is always defined as being perpendicular to the incoming flow. So we have the incoming flow W along here, and lift here, L, is always in the direction that is perpendicular to this incoming velocity. Even if we change this instance angle up to kind of uh, 40 degrees or so, this lift force here will still be defined as being perpendicular to the incoming flow. And that's partly because it's a convenient way of doing things, but also partly it's simply a way the data is collected. If you're in a wind tunnel, it's much easier to rotate your model inside the wind tunnel than it is to change the direction of flow and keep the model in the, in the same way. Uh, so it's, uh, that, that's one of the reasons why you end up with that definition of lift. And the drag force is always parallel to the incoming flow, but, uh, but to a first approximation we could ignore the drag. So how do we then relate that picture to our velocity triangle that we had a few moments ago? Well, the first thing to do is simply to flip it over. Uh, so we simply er uh, invert the aerofoil. So we don't change anything here in terms of the incoming flow. But now the lift is pointing down the page rather than up the page. We haven't changed the direction, uh, uh, th the sign of this instance. This is an incidence angle here is still positive. So if I just repeat that at the top of the page, to get something that looks a bit more like our velocity triangle diagram, we now need to rotate this, uh, this round so that it's such the wind is coming onto the aerofoil here, again with an incidence angle i. And then we have the lift force being perpendicular to that, uh, 
um, that incoming velocity and the drag being parallel to that. And you'll notice that's not perpendicular and parallel to the chord line of the aerofoil. Uh, the two things, are, two things are, are two different lines. And the other thing we might do here, just to make this a little bit easier when we draw diagrams later, is if we uh, if we draw the uh, the velocity vector starting from a slightly different point, we, we haven't really changed anything there. All we've done is is, is the instance angle is still in the same direction. Uh, you might want to convince yourself that's true, uh, but but that basically provides an easier way of drawing that uh, when we come to compare it to our other velocity triangles. So if we go back to that velocity triangle. What we have is we now have a relative flow coming in on, onto the blade, and this time we've drawn a line. Instead of being the chord line, this is just the line the relative uh, wind makes to the aerofoil, and this lift again is perpendicular to that uh, that line, and the drag is parallel to that particular line. And so that maybe explains where the confusion has arisen. People may be thinking the lift should be uh, perpendicular to the chord line of the aerofoil, and not the perpendicular to the incoming flow. So just to uh, clarify a bit further, if we draw that chord line uh, on the aerofoil here, uh, we can make some angle with that chord line and the axial direction. Now in this particular case, the uh, incoming velocity v is, is, is in the axial direction, there's no in swirl of a wind turbine, we've lined the wind turbine up with the incoming flow, uh, and we're going to call the angle that that velocity vector v makes with our chord line gamma, uh, which is known in the notes as the aerofoil inlet angle. And that's related to the, uh, to the uh, relative flow angle beta uh, by in fact the incidence. Uh, so if we have here we have the angle that the uh, relative velocity vector w makes with the axial direction is known as beta and the incidence i uh, is rela relates gamma and beta. But the thing I perhaps the other thing that's slightly confusing uh, is that uh, they're in slightly different directions because of the way the aerofoil data is is collected, this incidence angle, positive incidence, is actually in the opposite direction to positive gamma and positive beta, which follow the sign convention in our notes that everything is positive if it's in the direction of rotation. So the angles here, shown, uh, the arrows here, all show angles in the positive direction. So here gamma is positive, beta is positive, and i is positive, but they're actually in opposite directions. So we can close that triangle with, uh, with our blade speed, uh, but this leads to, uh, and, well, and we can get a lift, uh, again that's perpendicular to the incoming velocity and not the chord line of the aerofoil. So this leads to the slightly confusing situation where if we if we put the formula for instance, it's actually beta minus gamma, and that's because in this particular case uh, beta is larger than gamma because in this way it's drawn here that beta is less negative than gamma and so on and so forth. So it's sometimes easier, and the way I, I certainly think about it is to simply say that the magnitude of i is the magnitude of gamma minus the magnitude of beta. So I tend not to think about things uh, in terms of actual angles. Uh, I tend to think work out it, with angles with si with signs on them. I tend to think of it in terms of magnitude magnitudes of angles. Uh, and I, I guess I'd probably recommend that's the way you do it too, because uh, it seems to save a bit of confusion. So what we've got going on here is basically three angles. We have the aerofoil inlet angle, which is the line between the chord line and the axial direction, and this is really only set by the mechanical physical position of the blade. There's no variation with wind speed or anything like that. That angle is a geometric angle fixed by the geometry of the machine. Uh, and that's the angle gamma there, which is the angle between this chord line here and the axial direction. Then we have the relative flow angle beta, which is the angle between the relative velocity and the axial direction given here is beta. And this is controlled by a number of things that, well, it's, it's set by a number of things, some of which you have control over and some of which you don't. So it's set by the wind speed is one thing. If that wind speed goes up and down uh, and everything else stays constant, you can see that that uh, beta angle will change. It's also set by something as the radius, something as simple as the radius. So as we change the radius, uh, even if we have a fixed rotational speed omega, the radius varies, this u is going to vary, and that means this angle beta is going to vary up and down the blade, which kind of explains why aerofoil blades, uh, wind turbine blades, tend to be twisted. It's also set by the radius uh, and the rotate, sorry, it's also set by the rotational speed, omega, so if we vary the rotational speed of our turbine, uh, we will also vary this inlet angle beta. And then finally we have the instance angle i, which is basically the angle between the chord line and the in incoming flow, uh, i here, and this sign convention here gets a bit clumsy for our purposes, uh, and that's maybe why folk are getting a little bit confused uh, about uh, how these angles, uh, angles work, because the sign convention for i is basically the opposite direction to gamma and beta. 
So then what we want to do is relate these uh, lift and drag forces to uh, to what we do in turbines to produce some useful work output. So here we have again the relative velocity vector w uh, making an angle with the blade. This produces a lift force that's perpendicular to the relative velocity vector and a drag force that's parallel to this uh, velocity vector. But all that's a little bit academic because what we're actually interested in is the force that's operating in the direction of rotation. So that gives us the torque that drives the generator around. The rest uh, forces in other directions don't really help us very much uh, uh, that they sort of increase bearing forces and, and produce loads on towers and things like that and so on and so forth, but they don't help us. So after a little bit of geometric uh, fiddling we can uh, determine that this angle between the tangential direction and the lift force is actually beta. Uh, I'll leave that as an exercise for you to do if you don't quite believe me. Uh, and this for tangential force F theta, which is the thing that's driving the blade round and producing the torque, is a function not only of the magnitude of this lift force here, but also this angle beta. So F theta depends not only L, not not only on L but also on beta. And similarly, since we've uh, resolved that into the tangential direction, we also have a force resolved into the axial direction, and that really does nothing for us uh, except increase the load on the bearings of the wind turbine. So, just to sum up, uh, in terms of calculation of lift, so lift force is a function of incidence, so as the incidence is varied, the magnitude of that lift force is going to go up and down, uh, but the tangential force, the thing that we're interested in, depends on the relative flow angle beta as well as that lift force there. So, thank you very much for your attention. I uh, hope you found this uh, short video presentation useful. 